Please stand for the words of our King. Our Gospel this morning is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he, if he refuses to listen to even the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. Forever two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. So far our text. You may be seated. Dear Christian friends, the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ your Lord. We've seen how it is a church for all people. It is a church that will stand forever based on God's promise as He is the foundation. It will never perish. Last week we looked how the Christian bears his cross happily. The dear cross for Jesus. And he embraces the struggle as we are a militant church until one day we reach heaven when we will finally be triumphant with our Lord. But today we're going to look inward as a church. And so I want to tell you a story about two brothers. Whew, a little washed out. These two brothers were a little bit different in their career paths. The one um, it was a farmer. He liked to go and plant crops and harvest them. Then the other one tended to the flocks. We don't know if it was sheep or cattle exactly, but these two brothers grew up together and things were good, and they were both Christian. The one brought the best that he had to offer from his flocks, and he gave it to the Lord. And the other one also brought an offering to the Lord, but it was not the best. It was kind of what he had laying around, he knew that he should, and so he did. Well, God em embraced the, the best that the shepherd, the flock herder, had to offer, but he rejected the offering of the farmer. And it came along with a warning. He warned the farmer, if you do not adjust your heart, something far worse will happen. Well, our farmer friend did not listen to the Lord. Instead, he asked his brother, the shepherd, to go for a walk. And as they were walking in the field, the farmer killed his brother. This was the first first degree murder, and it happened in the first generation after Adam and Eve. The story of Cain and Abel is true. And it's a little terrifying. Because after the murder, our God came to Cain and he said, where is your brother? Not unlike what he did with his parents when he came to Adam and Eve and he said, where are you? As they were hiding. God knows where Abel was and God knew where Adam and Eve were. Of course, he was drawing out a confession and then with a calloused heart, Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? And I have to tell you, I had two brothers. And once in a while, my parents would come, not being omniscient, and they'd say, where are your brothers? And once, being a smart aleck, I would say, am I my brother's keeper? And that incurred the wrath of my parents, rightly so, because they understood the wanton, just irresponsibility of that comment. There's no place for that. This is a little bit heavier message today, but I have to tell you, it is a very important one. Because as a church functions together, this is how it kind of heals itself from within. Because if it does not care for each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, it just gets divided up. I have to tell you, and 
I have been blessed with the opportunity to do some consulting for our church body. And I'd go up and down the East Coast and I'd visit a lot of churches. And probably in about a third of them, the churches, there's a certain amount of dysfunction in every Christian's life because we're sinners. But you can tell when a church doesn't forgive itself. Meaning from within, when the individuals don't know how to be their brother's keeper. It's horribly destructive. And it is a walking minefield of guilt and just bitterness. So today we go forward under the theme, the church fulfills her role as her brother's keeper. Hear verse 15 once more. If your brother sins against you, Go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. I have to tell you a story. I have a colleague who received a phone call, and it was from a woman in his church who went on this little rant about something that wasn't very terrible, about someone else in the church. And he listened to it for about 30 seconds, didn't say a word. He acknowledged that it was him talking. And then he hung up. Now I said, oh, okay, I don't normally hang up on my members, but maybe that's one way to handle it. And he said the reason he did it was twofold. He said the woman, number one, knew better. Understand, this is addressed to the family of God. Jesus is talking to his disciples. Again, if someone on the street walks by and steps on your foot, You assume the best, right? You take everyone's words and actions in the kindest possible way, in general. That's a great way to go through life, seriously. But if there is an obvious wrong that was done by someone, whether it was known or not, it needs to be addressed. And so if this person calls up and there's gossip, you do not want to encourage that at all. And you just hang up. This picture is a picture from inside of that glorious church in France that we've been putting up this whole time. It's kind of, the, in my mind, the quintessential church. But I had a hard time finding a picture from within because nobody wants to take a picture from within. It doesn't look that great. Because that looks way cooler, doesn't it? But that's your vantage point, my friend. Because you're in here. I don't know what Star of Bethlehem looks like on the outside. But you're in here now, so... Congratulations. So how do we work with each other? Well, all it took was one look from the pastor to that woman as he walked on Sunday because she was a mature Christian. She had been coming her whole life and she knew what she did was out of line. And just one little look was all it took to correct her. Because we're going to walk through exactly what she was supposed to do. Let's consider it one more time. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. So, this is a cringeworthy part. It made the kids uncomfortable until I said, what if your brother does it to you? And then Madison, of course, piped up, well, this is what I do. But it's not always so easy. If it's your brother, of course, I suppose you know what's going on. But if it's someone in the church and it's public and you're kind of friends and we're all nice here, we have our Sunday best on, even with a mask, I guess there's still some formality with public worship. You have to go over and you point out a wrong. And I suppose the other part is, you were wrong. And I kind of want to say, Lord, is it really fair that I'm the one who was wrong and then I have to go out of my way to do something about it? That doesn't seem fair. I suppose not, but I guess we just talked about bearing your cross, pick it up and start walking. This is what your God calls you to do. You were wrong, and God calls you to go over and confront this other person, or at least point it out in love. And then this is the last part of the verse. (coughs) If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. Remember, that is the goal. The goal is to not, I got you. The goal is not hang it over their heads so you can guilt them into doing something. The goal is to win their brother over. That means you go back to Christ and Jesus' love compels you. This is something very good. The prophet Ezekiel understood that this was very serious, but that is such a neat portion of Scripture because you hear the gospel plea at the end, why will you die, O house of Israel? 
That's the goal, is always to win your brother over. That's the motivation. Now, verse 16. <clears throat> but if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that, the, so that every matter be, may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. This portion of Scripture um, is a quote from Deuteronomy 17.6 and Deuteronomy 19.15. Both are in reference to crimes committed and how you cannot convict someone on a crime. That's the first one in Deuteronomy. And the second one is you can't kill anybody. You can't obviously condemn someone to death on just hearsay, one person saying something. So you let the matter be established by two or three witnesses. This comes up again. Paul brings it up in his letter to the Corinthians. And the writer to the Hebrews brings this up again. Five places in Scripture. God uses this concept. That the matter may be, may be established by two or three witnesses. The point is, let's say that they don't care what you think. They think that you're nuts. And they say, go pound sand. Now you bring along Pete. You bring along, you, Ed, so you go find somebody else. Maybe who saw it, obviously, or if this is a problem, you say, hey, this is really serious. Did you do this? Is this something that really happened? And then if they say, don't, and this is where you could maybe even bring me in, and you say, listen, I've tried to do it on my own, and I don't know what to do. That's great. I'll help. That's what I do. I'm just, I just help. And that's the, that, that's the best we can do. All right, well, let's say they go tell, they tell me and you and a two, two other person, go pound sand again. Okay, then what do you do? Remember, the goal is still to win your brother over. Then you have unrepentant sin on your hand, and what do you do with it? Now, some people say, Pastor, what's the big deal? Who really cares? Do we have to do anything about this? And the problem is, of course, that unrepentant sin damns. And I know that confrontation is terrifying to some people, but God doesn't give you that option. And so it is the highest act of love to go out of your way to talk to someone. And now this next verse is where we talk about church discipline. And verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he, if he refuses to listen to even the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. So they don't listen to you. They don't listen to you and one or two other people. And so now you bring it before the church. And how it would play out in Star Bethlehem Lutheran Church, we have a church council. Um, Tom Parsley is our elder, and I am the pastor. We are ex-official members. We do not get to vote on the church council for this reason. It's never had to be used in my 18 years, but it might someday. Many of my colleagues have had to do this. The council would talk about it, and they would vote upon it, and they'd say, well, this needs to go be for the church, and then... At a congregational meeting, it'd be a voters' meeting. We would bring it before the church that this is some open, unrepentant sin. And then the congregation would vote to remove that person from our membership. Now, I, I can tell you stories and examples of this. Bizarre ones where a couple gets a, a divorce, and then within a month, they're both in church with their new SOs. And it's just weird, and the Church is like, well, how do we deal? I mean, in wide open public sin. This is usually where it happens. And I am so thankful this has not happened. Because it's awkward, and if it happened, I suppose you take the bull by the horns and you follow the will of our God and we try to do our best. But some of the pushback that I get is, how is this loving? Because this is inside baseball stuff, right? Right? And if you're standing on the outside going through the food pantry and you hear this going on, what does it sound like? Does it sound necessarily good and wholesome? And I guess I don't really care. There's a soul at stake. And I have to circle back around to how terribly dangerous this is. How did it look to the whole world when Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, that's where it's found, goes up to Peter. And this isn't something that we talk about a lot. And he confronts him. 
in his hypocrisy. This is not a power struggle. This is, again, a matter for the gospel was at stake. And he went out of his way to restore that because you had Gentiles who were getting beat down who thought they weren't good enough. Which, of course, is hogwash. It's not true at all. So also, if something happens like that in our midst, it is the highest act of love. And the introduction to the first lesson was, if you know that your neighbor's house is on fire, oh well, I don't want to get in the way. They might get mad at me. No, you go running in there. You drag them out. They can get mad at you later. That you, I was sleeping so well and you woke me up. How dare you? Of course it's ridiculous. Yeah, this is that important. That's why we do that, and this is the charge from our God. And so I suppose it doesn't really matter how it looks. Another misconception is that this is not you are wronged on Sunday. Monday you go talk to them. They don't listen. Tuesday you go bring somebody else. They don't listen. Wednesday, we have the council meeting. Thursday, voters meeting, they're excommunicated. <laughs> no, that's not how it works. This is a slow process. Remember what the goal is, to win your brother over, to restore the Christian faith of this person. This takes time and prayer. And this is where Jesus brings it up. This is verse 19. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you in my Father in heaven. Whoever two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. You have the definition of the church. Two or three Christians gathered together. And you have a promise to answer that prayer. And so by all means, you take time. And you leverage every possible means. Prayer is the first. To say, Lord, please lead this person to repentance. So that they might be spared. This is why it's so important. Now, some people have said, Pastor, I understand what you're saying. I understand it's important, but why would they listen to me? And I would say, I get it. I understand where you're coming from, but this is where 18 comes in. It's so important. I tell you the truth. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. God has given you the ability to forgive sins. It is as if there is a door to heaven and you get to open it. When you go to someone and say, you are forgiven. That is an incredible responsibility and privilege to do. And i got to tell you, it's a lot of fun. And you also have the responsibility to say, heaven is closed, as if Jesus himself were standing here saying, you're not going. That's a very hard conversation to have, but that's the same privilege and responsibility. You have to do that. Because in that first lesson, remember, God tells Ezekiel, if you tell the person that they're going to die for, from their sin and they ignore you, they're still going to die for their sin, but you will, be saved, you will have saved yourself. You've done your part. Because I'm here to tell you that not every story ends well. I have, this is a problem that I had. It's not really a Messiah complex, but it's this thought, if I just say the right things, if I do the right programs, if I'm nice enough, people will like my God. And it doesn't work. The gospel creates faith. The Spirit is the one who burns in that heart. And so I've learned with a wanton disregard just to use that word and to season my speech with it. Be the salt of the earth, my friend. That is our goal, finally, in life. Now, <clears throat> there's one last plug, and this is when people look at this and they just want nothing to do with the concept of church discipline. Sometimes when I go do an evangelism visit, I get to a door, and they sit down, they talk with me, and they say, I, I like you, great, thanks, I like what you're saying, but I don't really want to be a part of a church. And they had been burned into the church before, had a bad experience, and I'm, I'm, I'm really okay, good. You know, you can come by in a month and talk to me, that's fine, but I'm not going to join. And they say, why would I want to? Can't I just read my Bible here at the house? 
Isn't that enough? You say, well, you could. But first of all, God says, don't give up meeting together. Some are in the habit of doing, and it sounds like you're in the habit of not meeting together. Don't do that. Come on back. But the other one is, who's going to come after you if you fall astray? I had the incredible opportunity to spend some time on the Shenandoah River this week with Lukey. It was awesome. But it's also dangerous. I would not advise any of you to go fishing alone in a canoe on a river. Because people die every year on that river, on that stretch. It doesn't take much to slip and fall and whack your head on one of the limestone ridges at the bottom of, the, of that river. And then you drown. You can talk to the outfitters, and they will tell you. They won't give you a canoe after the river reaches a certain height because it's, it's just too much flow. It is dangerous, my friends, to go through this life because you're on a river that's surrounded not by rocks, but by spiritual forces of evil, is how Paul describes it. You are clothed with sinful flesh, surrounded by a sinful world and plagued by the devil who would do you harm. And part of the joy of being in a congregation is that we are our brother's keeper. We do look out for each other. And especially in 2020, I've seen that in action. And I'm so proud of my flock who, as you've called each other, and reached out. Because that's just what we do as a family of believers. That is what makes us strong. And when we are hurt from within, God gives us a plan on how we can work through that and how we can find peace, and how, yeah, we can even come out of it stronger when we can encourage each other and confront sin and be forgiven and turn around as we win each other over, over and over again. That is what it means to be part of a family of believers. And that's part of what makes it joyful, because you are not alone. And as the church is one foundation, you build each other up with Jesus. Amen. Please stand.